it's time to get started with our keynote speakers. So, so first up, we have Dr. Jason Kelly. Jason is the director of the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute and associate professor of British history in the Indiana University School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI. He is a visiting research fellow at Newcastle University and a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. As director of the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute, Dr. Kelly supports IUPUI's research mission by directing the IAHI grant programs, identifying and fostering transdisciplinary research collaborations, and organizing research workshops and symposia. Dr. Kelly's research projects focus on the histories of the environment, human rights, and art. So he's the perfect person to talk to us today, right? Come on up, Jason. Can you guys welcome Jason? I think it works. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Um, I, before I get started, I just want to thank Sarah, Sarah and Betsy and everybody who had a hand in organizing these wonderful events. Um, and I thank the folks from the Crossroads Project for putting on such a beautiful event last night. Um, if you didn't get a chance to see it, I encourage you, hopefully they'll be in town again soon, we can see it again, because uh, it's great. Um, Sarah asked me to talk today uh, about the ways that we can use arts, sciences, humanities, and bring them together in the context of thinking about environmental research. And so uh, one of the things that she asked me to speak about was some of the work that we do up at IUPUI through the Arts and Humanities Institute, specifically our Rivers of the Anthropocene program. So I'll be talking about that in the last third of my talk today. Uh, but before I get there, I kind of want to talk about why it's important in the first place to bring together the art, sciences, and the humanities and how we might do it. So that's kind of how my talk is structured. So I have some formal things up front. I actually wrote it out by hand here. I'm going to read a little bit for you. Um, but as we go on, it will get more informal. At any point, please just stop me and ask me if you have any questions on anything. So. Three years ago, I traveled to San Francisco to attend the American Geophysical Union Conference. For those who don't know what the conference is like, imagine 25,000 geophysicists, <laughs> hydraulic engineers, geochemists, and space uh, scientists descending on San Francisco to talk about earth science. That's kind of what the feel is like. And it was uh, 2016, I guess it was two years ago, and uh, I should say it was 2015. That was when it was exciting. 2016, December wasn't great. Um, <laughs> 2015. That year, the mood was really exhilarating. Uh, many people who were there had just gotten off the plane from Paris, where they had attended the climate conference, where 195 countries had signed a legally binding climate deal meant to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius. It was a diplomatic and environmental success, and presumably it was the first step in a grand attempt to address the greatest challenge facing humanity. I was there to speak on a special panel on the Anthropocene, put together by the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, or IGBP. To my surprise, I wasn't the only humanist on the panel. In fact, I wasn't even the only historian on that panel. Uh, there were two historians on the panel, but I think we were also the only two out of 25,000 people there who were historians. <laughs> we were one of three IGBP panels at the AGU that year, and it was the last three that the IGBP would ever hold. As it turns out, this meeting at the AGU was the last hurrah for the organization. It was closing up shop, and its various projects were transferring over to a new organization, Future Earth. Since 1987, IGBP had been at the forefront of scientific research on global environmental change. They'd been central participants in the field of earth system science, and the group had been a central player in convincing countries around the globe of the looming catastrophes humanity faced because of its addictions to fossil fuels and artificial fertilizers. It was an IGBP newsletter in 2000 where Nobel Prize laureate Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer first proposed the idea that humanity had entered a new geological age, the Anthropocene. So why was the IGBP closing up? and transferring its projects to future Earth. It was because IGBP's leaders had recognized that we had entered a new moment in climate science. 
Despite the deniers, decades of evidence revealed the scale of anthropogenic environmental change. The IGBP had done its job. It had collected the data. It had analyzed and synthesized the data. And now it had turned over that data for the rest of humanity to respond to their findings. To do this, those in the natural sciences needed to work with those in the social sciences, in the humanities, in the arts. They needed to work with designers, with policymakers, and with community leaders. This was the mission of future Earth, to bring together those individuals specializing in geobiophysical <coughs> work with those working in sociocultural work in order to affect real change across the globe. But how can those working in the sciences collaborate with those in the arts and humanities? This is the question that we're addressing today. But before we can get to that question, we have to make the case for the importance of that union in the first place. Um, why we want to bring together the sociocultural and the geobiophysical. So, in order to do that, I want to turn to an example here in Indiana. And the great thing about this is I don't think I have to say IGP. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may remember the 2012 drought here in Indiana. In fact, it wasn't a drought just here in Indiana. A number of climate systems had converged across the country, and 80% of the contiguous United States was in drought conditions in the middle of the summer. The economic costs were astounding. $40 billion in agricultural losses alone. While this was happening, leaders in Indianapolis were having a debate over the city's water infrastructure. Over the previous century, the city had built three large reservoirs north of the city in order to provide the city with a constant flow of water. Eagle Creek, Morse Reservoir, and Geist Reservoir. But developers, business groups, and government officials were worried that this wouldn't be enough to keep up with the demand over the next two decades. They were specifically concerned with being able to keep up with so-called peak water demand, the maximum draw on water reserves at any one time. The proposed solution was to create a fourth reservoir, that one up in the top right there. They would flood the White River between Anderson and Muncie. And for those unfamiliar with the area, this would flood the area along Mounds State Park threatening not only the structural integrity of this important archaeological site, but also potentially destroying unknown sites, oops, I jumped ahead here, also destroying unknown sites closer to the river. The 2012 drought was a powerful and was powerful ammunition for proponents. And they were going to call it Mounds Lake Reservoir. And they thought it would be a great development. Here's what the drought looked like on the ground, and this is what gave them their ammunition. This is water consumption in Indianapolis over the course of 2012. You'll notice that at the beginning of the summer, water consumption moved from roughly 100 million gallons per day to a peak of about 230 million gallons per day in the middle of the summer. And when comparing this consumption to stream flow data, we can see that this increased consumption corresponded to decreased stream flow. In this chart, the green stuff, uh, we're looking at the stream flow along the White River. Peaks in stream flow correspond to rain events, a few of which happened over the course of the summer. See, exactly, every day it rained here. <laughs> At the height of the summer, residents were pulling 84 million gallons a day from Morse Reservoir and 42 million gallons a day from Geist Reservoir alone. Morse Reservoir was already four and a half feet below normal, and every five days it was dropping a foot. We can see that rain events correspond to drops in water consumption. We can also see that as soon as the mayor's office banned lawn irrigation, water consumption dropped off precipitously. So we can infer that the most, most of the increased water usage over the summer was due to dom actually domestic lawn irrigation. The problem is, if we're building water infrastructures to correspond to peak demand, then peak demand up here is where we're looking at. If we take lawn irrigation out of the equation, then in fact peak demand is somewhere down here, significantly lower space. And this is before we ever consider any other water saving measures. Peak demand in this case is then not just a problem about 
engineer. Um, it's a problem for those who, specializing, who specialize in understanding culture as well. And that's because the green laws are a product of a long historical process that goes back to the 18th century. I couldn't do it without British history. <laughs> In the 18th century, wealth, power, and gentility in Western Europe and the United States became associated with green lawns. And by the 20th century, the ideal of the green lawn was a symbol of middle class identity. William Levitt, the creator of the Levitt Towns, argued for their importance when describing the suburban ideal. No single feature of a suburban residential community contributes as much to the charm and the beauty of the individual home and the locality as well-kept lawns. <laughs> and today in Indianapolis, this symbol of well-kept green lawns remains a symbol of privilege and status. This story of water consumption in Indianapolis during 2012 is only one small example of how geobiophysical and sociocultural systems are entangled with each other. And it begins to point to the importance of studying them in tandem. It also reveals their research, analysis, and policy are likely to need insights from a range of disciplines working together. But as we know so well, there often seems to be an unbridgeable divide between STEM and the arts and humanities, despite the best intentions of interdisciplinary researchers or organizations such as Future Earth. This is a real concern. In fact, it's a major challenge for us when considering how important it is to mitigate the effects of anthropogenic climate change now, the concern over a division between the arts and humanities, uh, I'm sorry, the arts, humanities, and the social and the sciences isn't new. In 1959, the physicist, novelist C.P. Snow complained that British education privileged the humanities over science and education. We don't hear that, uh, or engineering, we don't hear that much anymore. <laughs> the title of his essay, The Two Cultures, has summed up for many scholars the deep divisions between <coughs> science and the arts and humanities. C.P. Snow certainly wasn't the first scholar who complained about the divide between the sciences and the arts and humanities, but for the late 20th century, his essay helped set the terms of the debate, especially during the so-called science wars of the 1990s. And it's those terms of the debate that many others have responded to uh, in their attempts to bring science, art, and humanities together, most specifically E.O. Wilson, who probably many of you know, uh, his 1998 book, Consilience. So how do we, in fact, bring all of these disciplines together in the context of environmental research? I want to say three things. To start, I would suggest that we abandon C.P. Snow's binary. Um, there's more that unites the disciplines than divides them. Uh, I'm sorry, there's more than you, that unites the disciplines than divides them. And imagining science and arts and humanities as opposites creates problematic paradigms. We see this all the time in public discourse when politicians argue for the importance of science education over pursuing things like degrees in the arts and humanities. The discourse has become so toxic that the long-term viability of arts and humanities programs is in jeopardy, and it, in fact, often misrepresents what scientists do in the process. Likewise, in the way that they're often framed in the context of environmental research, this polarity suggests that science gathers useful facts about the world, and that the only way for the arts and humanities to contribute is to serve as science communicators. In this scenario, the value of the arts and humanities is in the service of the sciences, to provide pretty visualizations or to make science more accessible. It's not that these aren't valuable forms of collaboration, but they reduce the arts and humanities to subsidiary roles and lessen the profound intellectual contributions they have to offer. Secondly, to bring the arts and humanities together with the sciences, we need to recognize two facts. I have lots of lists. I, I didn't realize I had so many lists. <laughs> two facts. I'll call them A and B so that we don't have to do numbers again. <laughs> a. Uh, first, uh, we're pursuing the same project, the quest for knowledge and insight into our place in the universe. Scientia and sapientia, knowledge and wisdom. B, the arts, sciences, and humanities face the same fundamental challenges. 
specifically the hyper-instrumentalization of knowledge. By this, I mean a system wherein all value is determined by its commercialization. We're living in a world in which basic research is being undermined by a political and economic and a cultural attitude that determines worth by short-term economic outcomes. A techno-libertarian dystopia in which public goods are put in the hands of private interests. One in which charter schools can compete for students in an open market. One in which space travel is being handed over to private companies. One in which university faculty are being driven to develop private enterprises out of their research. One in which knowledge, is produced by research, knowledge produced by researchers is being put into the hands of private companies such as Elsevier and then sold back to the researchers who created the knowledge in the first place. One in which university degrees are valued by a graduate's immediate employability meaning their usefulness to the immediate needs and interests of private companies. That's how we determine the value of a degree. By hyper-instrumentalization, I'm not referring to research that serves a public good or has some social utility. Rather, I'm talking about a fundamental shift in which all human intellectual and creative endeavors serve capital. One in which business acumen stands in for knowledge and financial success substitutes for wisdom. This hyper-instrumentalization of knowledge is a threat to the shared project of the humanities, arts, and sciences. And in this, we're all in it together. Three. <laughs> the third principle I think is important for bringing together the arts, sciences, and humanities in environmental research is what we might call methodological polyvocality. <laughs> I was very proud of myself. <laughs> this is one of the most challenging approaches to implement in the current research environment. Methodological polyvocality offers equal voice and interpretive significance to ice core analyses, to oral history, to community-based art projects, and that each of them can reveal a different and complementary facet of our shared experience of the universe. And each of them captures something unique and valuable, from an understanding of climate's deep past, to the lived experience of day-to-day -day environmental change, to the co-production of knowledge and community education about the environment. Methodological polyvocality has the potential to reveal voices that have been silenced, and it frames the arts, humanities, and sciences as equal partners in the shared endeavor. All right, I told you I was going to read for a little bit. I'm done reading for the most part here. So rather than talk, continuing to talk in the abstract and throwing out things like multi-methodological um, uh, uh, polyvocality, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's actually happening on the ground, what we do, uh, to kind of illustrate some of this. So at the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute, we were founded in 2012. That same year, we started up a new research project called Rivers of the Anthropocene. Rivers of the Anthropocene is a multifaceted project, but at the core of it, it's an international interdisciplinary group of researchers, community members, uh, researchers across the fields, artists, geomorphologists, philosophers, theologians, you name it. Uh, we actually have um, over 80 scholars in 12 di different countries involved in this project. Looking at water as the way to begin to understand this grand transformation of the environment that we're experiencing called the Anthropocene. We're organized as a loose network of folks across the globe, and this is roughly the countries that we all work in. We hold things like conferences. So every year we hold some kind of conference or workshop. Our last big one was last year, actually. Uh, this was held up in Indianapolis and focused on the anthropology of the Anthropocene. Our next one is going to be looking at race in the Anthropocene. We do teaching. We teach classes and things like this. This is some of our students actually at the Eagle Creek Dam. Um, they're learning about how um, the, the, the water flows are managed in Indianapolis. Uh, we do research projects. Um, Several of the research projects include a project called Museum of the Anthropocene. Uh, Voices from the Waterways, that's an oral history project. The Anthropocene Household, which is the one I'm going to talk about in more detail today, and that's actually part of the Grand Challenges program, 
which Sarah mentioned before, which is that $55 million uh, project. We're also part of uh, the Sustainable Water Future Program, which is a project of Future Earth. And we are the working group for memory, place, and community in global water systems working group. I did not name that. Scientists named that. They said they thought my. I, I, I suggested we call it the Museum of the Anthropocene. And they said, no, no, no. We should have this. <laughs> That's our working group name. We publish thing. Uh, we publish lots of things. This is a recent book we published. This is from last year. This is open access. Um, so we're big open access advocates. So you can get this for free. Um, on uh, a download from University of California Press, but also any of the online book dealers will have it for free. You can download it onto your reading devices. We have an Anthropocene primer. If you are new to the Anthropocene, this is fantastic. Um, it's a set of online exercises that will walk you through. It's open to everybody. Again, it's open access. And you can actually participate in dialogue with people. You can highlight pieces of the Anthropocene Primer, make your comments, and let people respond back to you, including us if you're putting comments on there. If you're teaching classes, you can use this as a private online space to teach your students. You can set up a private working group where you can leave comments for your students, and you can mark up the documents together. Everybody's name is left in there, but it's private to you. We can't see any of that. And it's constantly growing. So next year, version 2 will come out. And we're also in the process of putting together a uh, physical, an analog copy of the Anthropocene Primer, which will be slightly different than the online Primer. They'll be complementary to each other. Um, and you can use those in classes as well. We do lots of public programs. Um, we do things like uh, uh, bringing speakers together. Um, this is uh, Jim Enote. Uh, he's a, a Zuni uh, elder. Um, and this is Imhotep Adisa who's one of our partners at the Kepper Institute in Indianapolis. Um, he runs a community organization that's focused on dealing with uh, environmental justice. Um, and it put them in conversation about the different farming techniques that they do in the urban and then the rural environment. We do exhibitions. Uh, my uh, last year's postdoc, uh, who just got a tenure line position at the University of British Columbia this year, so she's not here anymore. Um, she did an exhibition down at the Santa Fe Art Institute last year. And this is an exhibition from Rebecca Allen, who is here as part of the Crossroads project that we did in Indianapolis in 2015. As part of that, we did lots of engaged public programming, uh, including more traditional public engagement, such as this talk we gave at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. But we did more non-traditional, informal learning opportunities. This was a public, an open public walk-in sketch. And so Rebecca led the artistic side of things. And a guy named Tom Swinford, who's a biologist, led the interpretation of the flora in the area. And we had lots of people show up and lots of different community partners involved in all of this. And while we were there, people took photographs, and they drew things, and they wrote poetry, and they talked, and they learned together. And then when we were done, we scanned everything in and made a book right on site. And so we had a book at the end of the day that everybody could take home and enjoy uh, with what we want to share with them. We took all of these lessons and tried to integrate them into the Anthropocene household. These are the three facets of the Anthropocene household. Oral histories, water sampling, and community seminars. The Anthropocene household is called that because we were trying to have these conversations about environmental change with people out along the river, for example. And we talked about things like nitrogen flux, and we talked about uh, parts per million carbon dioxide, and all of these things. And these are big global issues that affect you, but you don't think about them necessarily from day to day. They're big global things. And that's how Earth system science often thinks about the world in these big global terms. So what we thought was, well, what if we just flip the Anthropocene narrative on its head, and we looked at the day-to-day -day lived experiences of the Anthropocene, as opposed to the big global change experience of the Anthropocene, and we'll look at it from the household level. And we'll do this with the community partners we already have in Indianapolis, who are already working in the environmental justice space. 
and uh, we will work with them to determine what questions we're going to ask. We're going to work with them to make the connections with other people in the neighborhood, and we're going to let them lead um, portions of the project with us. Um, so, in fact, community seminars, these are based on a series of seminars we do on public art and ethics in Indianapolis. Um, these are actually going to be held at the Kepper Institute in the community. We circulate readings. People come and discuss big ideas um, as part of, part of that. So they'll be reading anything from kind of highly scientific papers to <coughs> news reports and discussing and debating how they affect them in the neighborhood. This begins in January. The oral histories part of the project began last year. Uh, we're collect as part of the voices from it's kind of connected to the voices from the waterways project. We're collecting a series of people's uh, oral histories about people's experiences of their environment in Indianapolis. Uh, so far, we have about 36 of them. These will continue to grow to hundreds in a born digital um, framework. So all of this stuff is transcribed. All of it is in, going to be entered into a database. All of it is marked up so that other museums or other libraries can take it and create mirror sites of the Voices from the Waterways project as well. This has been really great to kind of getting people's understanding of their environments in Indianapolis. Um, there's so many things you learn just by sitting down and talking to people and letting them tell their stories. Um, one thing is that um, the environment means many different things to many people. Um, you know, when you're uh, talking about the city of Indianapolis, um, environment isn't just about lead in your house, although that's really important. It's about whether you're safe on the streets as well, um, and who is guaranteeing your safety on those streets. Um, so those are all really important issues that are part, have become now part of the Anthropocene for our analysis here on the ground. The water sampling, uh, this begins next month. Our first, our first testing begins next month. We're using three different methodologies to test out how this works best for the community. Um, basically, it's a citizen science project. People do their own um, sampling from their houses. Um, we're going to have a mobile van, uh, which is skinned with the Anthropocene Household Project. There's going to be, you know, the, the lawn signs for political... Those are all going to be down the street. So when your street, when we're rolling into your street, that that week, they're all going to be on your street. And we're going to do house to house lead testing. And we have the equipment that can give us readings within about two to three minutes for every person's house. We're working with the Red Cross as part of this to bring anybody who wants it. They will actually install uh, smoke detectors in anybody's houses there. We're going to be doing soil testing and actually allowing people to bring in vacuums into their homes to test the lead in their environment. We're working with our public health pro program up in Indianapolis to do that. At the end of this, we'll think, we think we'll have the most, um, the largest database of uh, water, what people are consuming um, in Indianapolis. Uh, it, I, we hope it um, uh, can become a model for other projects uh, around the country. So, that's the Anthropocene household. All of these pieces sit together. Uh, the people who are participating in the oral histories, they're connecting us to people who might want to participate in the water sampling. Um, we're letting our community partners take the lead. Um, and we actually have, for any of you who might be in the room looking for positions as PhD students, we have a position for a PhD student. So just something to think about. Um, and. Uh, so what I think you see here is that methodological polyvocality. <laughs> I'm going to keep using that until you all buy it. <laughs> we have the science here. We have the, the humanities here. Um, what we haven't mentioned to you is that these community seminars, when this information gets fed back to people, they're actually going to be able to create um, exhibitions that will help fund around those as well which will integrate different methods for them to um, represent or respond to the information that they find. Um, so there is an art, community art engagement part of all of this as well. So that's my pitch <laughs> for the importance of bringing together the arts, humanities, and the science.
So my question is about if the anomalies and the walls. I could say, okay, we don't need to build the fourth reservoir if people don't go to walls. So what is the practical proposal? Like to go for people in Pakomodus to go to Papusha campus, for example. So, to, uh, so, 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 so what is the practical proposal? So if the homeowners don't go in grass, what do you want to play the zero stage? Zero planning or zero the desert plant or something. So yeah, there's there's a number of different ways to do this. I, I moved here from Southern California, um, and so so our approach to lawns is very different there. In the last several years, people have been painting their lawns uh, <laughs> green to keep it green. Um, but the government was actually helping to subsidize uh, people's uh, people to put natural plantings or. Um, boulders and things like this, which I think you, you just suggested is one of the solutions, which is to move away from the green lawns and move to uh, um, native plantings uh, that uh, can can handle the water stress um, that you that we be, we're beginning to see more and more of that drought stress here in Indianapolis. That's just one solution to it. Uh, my point was not necessarily we need to get rid of lawns. Uh, my point was. Let's not plan our water infrastructure around our lawns. Um, so I think that's really important to, to keep in mind that if we had a few people, if we twenty percent of, if we could get twenty percent of people to use less water, um, that might be the thing that covers the expansion of the population and the growth of industry in Indianapolis. And we don't really need to do that much. Um, and then when we do have our droughts, stop watering your lawns. It's <laughs> anybody else? I'm just curious, what happened to the Mounds Lake project or the notion mm. of the flooding through um, from Anderson? Where is that at? So, um, Sounds very scary. Yeah, there was a temporary reprieve um, when just above Geist there's a big uh, quarry which they are about to start filling in with water as yet another <coughs> space for, for water. Um, but that's not that much reservoir um, so they what they've they've gone quiet mm -hmm. but things are moving forward um, who is they forward yeah so there's actually a website for all of this um, it's uh, it's the proponent so the this back in 2014 when this was really moving forward it was the city council of Anderson that was pushing this forward as a way to help drive development mm -hmm. in the area and of course increase the tax base and mm -hmm. uh, move new residents into the area um, but this is still it's simmering there it hasn't it hasn't entirely gone away